Hello, and thank you for joining us for another inspiring message from Journey Church. To learn more about our ministries, please visit us online at journeychurch.org. Now here is today's message. Welcome once again. I'm so glad that you're here today. We're concluding a series today called What is the Gospel? And uh, we've spent a number of weeks talking about this subject. If you haven't been here for the series, I encourage you to really go online and learn more about it. You can go to the media tab on the Journey Church website and all the previous messages are out there where you could go ahead and watch them. It's been really a life transforming series for me personally. I hope it has been for you as well. There's been such great content. Much of the content was inspired by a guy named Matt Chandler who wrote the book Explicit Gospel and he is the head of an organization called Acts 29. It's not really a denomination, it's more of a network of churches of which we're a part of, and we don't generally share that all the time, but it's important to know that we're not standing here alone, that there's actually 463 churches, I believe, at current count that are part of the Acts 29 network all around the United States, all around the world, that are um, pressing on and preaching the gospel and the centrality of this gospel message. And I'm going to do something that we've never done in the history of Journey Church today. We're actually going to play a video by Pastor Matt Chandler, the head of the Acts 29 organization. He does an excellent job of sharing the gospel personally and its impact on our lives in this video. You see, there's churches all over over all 463 churches during the month of May are partnering together to advance the gospel through church planting. So there's these little cards that you have around your chairs that we've talked about in the previous weeks. Hopefully you took those home and prayed over them just a little bit. But Matt gave us a challenge. He said, here's the main points that we're trying to make. And he said, here's a video that I've recorded that you could watch for inspiration. Or if you feel led, you can uh, just play the video. So I watched the video and I said, there's no way I'm going to be able to articulate this stuff as good as Matt. Matt did. He's the president of our organization. I know it's weird, but would you give him a warm Journey Church welcome? If you have your Bibles, would you go ahead and grab them? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is where we're going to start. Uh, we'll move over to Romans 15 from there, but we're going to start out in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. Let, let me just start by saying that uh, and, and really acknowledging that I, that I know we're kind of all over the map uh, in here uh, today, and, and what I mean by that is there are those of you who love the Lord very much, have been following Him uh, passionately, and so I, I want to say that I'm glad that you're here and we get to get together as, as family members in the faith and, and worship the Lord together. Uh, and then I know there are those of you who maybe uh, are, are not there, maybe in process in some way, uh, and so I want to say to you, uh, welcome, and that I'm glad that you're here and pray that, that maybe some of the things that we see from the Word of God today would edify and encourage you. And I know some of you are here and, and, and aren't believers at all and don't know what to make of us and, and don't know really what to make about the claims that we have uh, about Christ and, and our view of the world and, and how the Bible would unpack for us human flourishing. And so uh, I wanted to say to you that even if you're maybe even hostile to uh, what you see and understand as the Christian faith, I'm, I'm glad that you're here also and you'll find that we are not a place that is nervous about or afraid of your doubts, concerns, questions uh, about the faith, and if we can help and serve you in that journey in any way whatsoever, uh, we would love to do that. And, and maybe the answers you'll get from us will just further uh, what you believe about us if you think that we're maybe ignorant and backwards. And, and I, I believe we can kind of hold up under that weight, but would love to have that conversation with you. Now, uh, I, I grew up uh, the, the bulk of my life, and I know some of you are looking at me you're like, you're 15, what do you mean the bulk of your life? But, but, but I grew up in my early days very confused uh, about what the Christian faith was, what, who, who Jesus Christ was, and how his death could possibly have anything to do with me. And so uh, I, I grew up just kind of uh, with a fundamental misunderstanding in what I perceived to be uh, a serious amount of hostility uh, on God's part towards me. And that was rooted really early on in my life when a friend invited me to vacation Bible school. I, I've told this story here uh, multiple times. And I, I go to vacation Bible school, and we do a little craft. And then it comes to singing time, and we sing a song about how God hates liars. And so really, I mean, as, as odd as this sounds, I'm, I'm probably eight around that time, about this, uh, the age of my, uh, my son now. And, and I remember that that's the first time it registered that if God hates liars, then God is not a fan of mine. 
that, that God does not want to hang out with me because if God hates liars, I, I know me, I, I could lie. I mean, it was, if it was a sport, I would have lettered. And, and so in, in light of God hating liars and me being so good at lying, it became evident uh, early on that, that this God, this Christian God was probably uh, not for me. Uh, that, that I needed to find uh, m- another way. It was always kind of a, a spiritual guy. I just couldn't, uh, I found the, 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 the thinking of there's nothing out there uh, but, but us to be, uh, I just couldn't, and, and maybe this means I'm weak-minded, but I just couldn't come to the, the position, even as a, a younger man, that, that all that love was was um, um, snaps is firing off in my brain and that all that beauty was is, is snaps is firing off in my brain. I, it just felt, and I know that, that sounds weird, it just felt like that couldn't be right. Um, and, and so was very much drawn to there being some type of deity, but I didn't know what that was, but it couldn't be the Christian God because he hated me because I'm a liar. And, and so really 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 9 through 11, is gonna, it's a great passage because it kind of walks um, it walks me through my own experience um, with the Lord and helps me get clarity on what the gospel is. And then from here, I want us to pan out and look at what this means globally as opposed to just individually. So let's look at this, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, that, that's that's what I heard early on, absolutely. So I'm a liar, God doesn't like liars, so I'm not gonna inherit the kingdom of God. So God's big plan of renewal and reconciliation for the world around to make all things new, to make all things right, I'm outside of that. There's a group that's inside of that, that group is not me, all right? It's a, it's a bunch of Ned Flanders with tucked in shirts and perfect lives um, who, who grew up with very few difficulties and right that that's who gets the kingdom of god they they haven't been drunk shoot they don't even drink uh, all right they they have never been to a party and they um generally in my experience were not very happy people and and so they get to inherit the kingdom of god but guys like me no not like me and then um the text continues Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, that just reads like a list of who I was hanging out with on the weekends. And so now, it's not just me that's not going to inherit the kingdom of God, but now these people that I love, my, my friends, the crew that I'm running with, they're out too. So now you've got this kind of in crowd, these kind of uh, Ned Flanders, high diddly ho, don't watch rated R movies unless it's about Christ being crucified, and then you've got my crew, and, and they're incompatible. Do not be deceived. Don't be fooled. Your crew, Chandler, they're not inheriting the kingdom of God. Your, your friends and you, you're out looking in. And, and so in my mind, there was this group of very clean, very well put together people that was very different than me, very different than the background I was coming from. And, and this is where I had this disjoint in who Jesus was and, and, and what in the world the death of Christ was all about. Like why would Christ come and die for people who starched their pants and then leave the rest of us out there um, to damnation? And so there was just a, quite a bit of confusion but then this next line this next line kind of helped me with some things verse 11 says and if you write in your bible this is a great verse to kind of underline or highlight or if you uh, color out into the margins draw a line out into the margins and write the word wow um here's what it says and such were some of you so now in an instant my understanding shifts because now church folk are those who are inside the kingdom those who are inheriting the kingdom of god this fullness of life that is found in jesus christ weren't just born into ned flanders type homes but actually were at one time all of these things so now in my head christians are those who have pulled themselves up by their bootstraps they are those with those testimonies that i used to be a drunkard i used to be addicted i used to walk in these ways but now no longer do i and that was a testimony that was often celebrated when i would uh stick my head in church uh and then they would give their story you know i used to get drunk every weekend would just pound a bottle of jack daniels but then i met jesus and i haven't been thirsty for it since and everybody would applaud and that dude would be signing bibles down front afterwards and right there was this celebration of he pulled himself up he's straightened himself 
out. And so, but still now, even in this moment, you've got the anti-gospel. That's not the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, what you and I celebrate as believers in Christ, is not that we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. But actually, we celebrate what is next in the text. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So this is where um, things click. All right, so in, in this, I'm going to ask you a question about the, the English language here, uh, okay? Uh, he, he says, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. Now, in, in that sentence, are, are you the active agent or are you the passive agent? Yeah, you're passive, all right, which means you didn't wash you, you were washed. You didn't justify you, you were justified. And you did not sanctify you, you were sanctified. So now the message of Christianity starts to come into focus for me. It's not that we're born in good families with good backgrounds and, and we've never partied, we never, and it's not that we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, but rather that by the Spirit of God, our hearts are awakened to the life, death, and resin, uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ as an atoning sacrifice for our sins so that in Christ we are viewed as perfect and spotless before him, not by any merit of our own, but by the merit of Christ alone. And so if, if Christians kind of wig you out in our celebration of God, in our love of God, and in our passion to live in such a way that we line ourselves up with how God has unpacked human flourishing, this is why, because he washed us clean because he justified us and because he sanctified us and it also if you're a believer in Christ th this text should really help you on how you view those who aren't believers that we are not better than but we are out of which means we view those who have not been pulled out of with compassion and empathy and mercy and not in harsh judgment uh, our enemies do not wear flesh and blood you tracking with me and, and this is what you and I have been, this is our story. This is our story. God saved you from the party scene or he saved you from empty religion, but there isn't anyone in this room who was not washed by God in Christ, justified by God in Christ, and is being sanctified by God in Christ. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. In fact, just a few weeks ago, we saw a ton of testimony about just this. Um, men and women got in the baptistry, and this is what they testified. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Here's what he pulled me out of. Here's what he's done in my heart. He's transformed me in these ways. And we kind of celebrated that God saves. Now, um, th this, is, th this is kind of a um, myopic view of our faith it's an awesome one i mean i just don't think i would i'll ever grow weary of celebrating the fact that god found me like why did he come and rescue me i was not looking for god um c.s lewis um famously said it's a terrifying thing to be an atheist because you never know when god's going to show up uh and he wrote that because uh he was a professor of medieval literature at, at oxford and, and cambridge and and his favorite his favorite medieval authors were all believers and and so he kept coming across the gospel in medieval literature and that's why i said scary thing to be an atheist you just never know when he's going to pop in you just never know when he's going to show off. And, and so in, in this, we, we celebrate the saving work of God on our lives. But so we can celebrate this and stay here and rejoice in this. I don't think I'll ever get weary of the fact that I was not looking for God, and yet he came and found me. I, I simply wasn't after him. I, I was after some ladies at the time. Uh, I was looking to uh, use um, that, that my uh, intrinsic gifts at that time to go into law to get a sweet ride and a nice house. And, and that was the trajectory of my life, to be rich, to be powerful, and to have an extremely attractive wife and babies that were either obedient or went to boarding school. And that was kind of what I was looking at. And in the middle of that, with all these doubts on what Christianity is, all these um, skepticisms about the Word of God, about Christians, about their worldview on everything from sexuality to uh, other pieces of morality, God just invaded all of that and opened up my heart without even answering my questions. That's one, one of the things I've marveled at is that, that apologetically speaking, God did not in those early days go, well, here's how the Bible works. Now believe in me. I, I mean, it just really didn't work that way. He's like, believe in me. Okay, now, 
Let's approach the question differently. And, and that's really how he rescued me. Now, from, from here, let me tell you where I want to go. Um, in cinema photography, that there is a way of shooting um, that, that's called extreme close-up. And so an extreme close-up is, is a shot in film that, that has only one detail in it. So it wouldn't be like a shot of a face close-up. That's just called a close-up. An extreme, extreme close-up would only have one detail of the face. So it would be a shot probably more, most likely used in movies uh, would be just uh, the iris of an eye and maybe you hear breathing and hear some drama, but you don't see anything but an eye maybe kind of darting or moving and then it pans away and you get to take in the rest of the details. And that type of shot is called an extreme close-up. It is extremely effective in regards to building tension and drawing in the watcher, but it does not make for good full-length feature film. All right, so two and a half, well, movies these say three and a half hours uh, of you just staring at a guy's mouth or, or at an eye, or at eyes, or at just a nose, or at a hair, does not make for compelling story. No one's even tried it. Not even the artsy films have tried this. All right, two hours of extreme close-up. All right, so it, it's an aspect of storytelling that can draw in and is effective, but you must eventually pan out in order to see all the weight of the story. And so, yes, Christ has saved us. Yes, Christ has sanctified us. Yes, Christ has redeemed us. But there is something much bigger than just you and I being called unto God going on here. And I want to show you some of what that is. And so now flip to your left and let's go to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. We're going to pick it up in verse 18. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard of him will understand. Now, I want to stop there, and I want to kind of paint. I wish we had more time. I wish we could do like a two-hour message here. That, that's not wise or good, so we'll just kind of stick in our tracks, and, and let me paint a picture for you uh, of what we see. Uh, we, we see back in early Genesis, God telling Abram, I'm going to bless all the families on the earth and throughout the Old Testament, the claim uh, of God through the prophets, through the psalmist, and through the law is that all nations uh, will be glad, that all nations will hear of the great and mighty works of God. And then at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God falls. Uh, Peter preaches a very unseeker friendly message, and 3,000 people uh, are saved. And you have the, the first fruits of uh, the Christian church, although uh, I would argue strongly that, that really the Christian church began back when God called Abram in Genesis chapter 12. You began to see the first fruits of post resurrection ascension Christianity taking roots in Jerusalem, first of all. And then from Jerusalem, it begins to spread, and Saul of Tarsus is converted to Christ um, supernaturally on the road to Damascus. He's not a seeker. He's not reading Kim, Tim Keller's books. He's not into apologetics. All right, God kicks him off his horse. Son of God reveals himself to Saul of Tarsus, all right, one of the most educated, brilliant Jews of the day, converts to Jesus Christ, and then begins to plant churches all over the ancient world. So what Paul would do is he would go into a place that had never heard the gospel. He would preach the gospel. Men and women would come to know him. And, and you can read all about this in the New Testament. The book of Acts chronicles it. And then all the writings of Paul you have in the New Testament are actually letters written back to those churches that he 
planted, but he didn't go and become the next pastor of First Baptist uh, you know, uh, Jerusalem. That's not what happened. There were no believers. He reasoned in the synagogue, sometimes for years. In fact, uh, the book of Acts tells us that he was in the city of Ephesus for six, seven years, and that he reasoned daily in the hall of Tyrannus. And what he would do was as men and women came to know Christ, he would disciple them, empower them, raise them up as leaders until they were established. They had their own elders, their own teachers, their, their, own, um, uh, their own established church. And then he would move on to the next place that had no church. And, and he would plant another church while simultaneously believers from the church he just planted would actually go out also and plant another church. And this is how Christianity spread throughout the ancient world so much so that historian Rodney Stark says that by 350 AD that 51% of the Roman Empire confessed Christ as Lord. So historically that means Constantine did not make Christianity but Christianity made Constantine. And so this is how it spread and Paul's conviction was people who have never seen will see and people who have never heard will hear. He's testifying to the power of the gospel to rescue men and rescue women from their sin, to call out from among the revilers, to call out from among the mockers, to call out from among the, the, the liars, you and I, to pull us out, to call us out, to wash us, sanctify us, and justify us before God. And then he continues in this text. This is the reason why I've so often been hindered from coming to you, but now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. So once again, you're just getting a picture of how the gospel spread through the ancient world. Now what you have happening here is he's saying, listen, there's no more work for me to do in this section of what was known then as Asia, right? There's no room left, right? There's churches in almost every city. Either I've planted a church or guys from the churches that I have planted have gone and planted churches. And what I feel called to is to go where they have never heard and to preach the gospel in fact i've been one to come see you in rome but you already got a church there that was established not by me but but i want to come see you but I've, I've been planting churches all over here now there's no room for me to work that is a marvelous idea there's there's, there's no room to work here all right the, the gospel is just known and embraced and being preached everywhere it's driving me crazy i've got to get out so here's my plan apparently in spain Things are pretty dark, so here's my plan, all right? I'm gonna swing by, hang out with you in Rome for a little while. I wanna encourage you, you can encourage me, and then I'm heading to Spain where they don't know Christ. And then when I get to Spain, I'm gonna do what I did back here. I'm gonna preach the gospel. Men and women will be saved. I will build up churches that build up churches that build up churches, and and then from there, uh, I'll run my race until God calls me home. But he's got a detour he's gotta make on the way to Spain through Rome, starting in verse 25. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem, for they were pleased to do it. Now listen to this. And indeed, they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, the church in Jerusalem, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessing. Now here's what's happening in in this text that I I think is marvelous and really will help you understand how we do ministry here at the church, uh, that when all's said and done, he's saying here that, that we are, we exist, the churches in Macedonia and Achaia exist because the church at Jerusalem was faithful. The church at Jerusalem was faithful to send out missionaries, to send out church planters, and to make sure that they didn't hoard the blessing of God in Jerusalem, but rather participate participated in God's plan to rescue and redeem from among every tribe, tongue, and nation on earth. And then we owe them the spiritual blessings that we have enjoyed. So let me, let me paint a picture like this. Um, the guy that starts to share the gospel with me uh, shared it in a football locker room. I was not a good athlete, all right? I, I know that you're having a hard time believing that. 
Um, I, I just tried really hard. Uh, I wish I had the story that I was a great athlete, but I blew my knee and then didn't get a scholarship. That's not my story. Uh, I didn't have to blow my knee to not get a scolarship, all right? I just needed to be me, all right? I was uncoordinated and lanky. It was really awful. And, um, and in the locker room after practice, a guy walks up to me and says, um, hey, I need to tell you about Jesus when you want to do that. I'm going to let you decide where we do this, but it's happening, so when do you want to do it? And, and then he, from there, invited me to church with him. In fact, I, I remember it clearly. He, he said, hey, we do this thing on Wednesday night called Jam. Would you like to come? And I said, Jam? Yeah, Jesus and me. Would you like to come? N no. No, I don't think I would. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I would. And, and then what he did in that moment is preaching the gospel to me with his mouth, he brought me to church and let me see, in many ways, the gospel with my eyes. And, and here's what I mean, like this little, the, the, the story that I began with about how my doubts, my concerns, uh, kind of figuring out how this thing worked, all that worked itself out as I was going to jam, singing awfully corny songs and spelling words with my body, all right, J-O-Y, right? As I'm doing that, what I'm learning is these are imperfect people. Like these people, they're, some of them are more train wrecked than I am. There are legitimate issues among these folk. These folk are far from perfect, but they are pursuing. They are seeking. They do want to love the Lord. They do want to bring their lives into greater submission to this God that they serve. And, and whereas Jeff, Jeff's mouth spoke the gospel to me, the church he pulled me into, First Baptist Church of Texas City, in many ways showed me the gospel. Now, here's the truth. Here's the historic reality of First Baptist Church of Texas City. Somebody planted that church, and somebody planted the church that planted that church, and somebody planted the church that planted that church that planted that church. In fact, if you have been ministered to in any way in this congregation, in our localized covenant community of faith, if you've been ministered to in any way, we are in many a way indebted to those who before us sacrificed time, energy, preference, and money to plant a church in an area that was perceived to be unchurched or underchurched, and there were men and women just like you, just like me, who sacrificed time, energy, and uh, really gifts and talents to plant a church so that the gospel might be known. In fact, the whole Christian um, growth globally has been done through the missional work of church planting. It's been what God has done since day one. He calls Abram to be a what? A people, a nation, a covenant community. And then what does he do in at Pentecost? He just forms the bride of Christ, the church, a covenant community of people. Now, let me, let me tell you why this is so important. Um, God has called us to a localized expression uh, of the kingdom of God, like you and I, we're, we're localized, right? We live in a time, in a location, and we are dedicated to one another in that location, but we must not lose sight of the whole in our celebration of the localized expression of the kingdom of God, because the kingdom of God is much bigger than that, and God is doing much greater things out there than simply what he's doing in our place. And it becomes imperative for us to know this and grasp this and get this because if you get myopic, if you go extreme close up in your understanding of our faith, there's a lot of residual issues that come with that. There will be an immense amount of worship in glory about Christ and not much else. There will not be a lot of praise songs sung about localized congregations. There will not be celebrations of this church or that church or what this church did or how this church over here fared. There will simply be a celebration of the covenant community of God all pulled together in the glories to make much of Jesus Christ. And I think many of us would be surprised who else there. And so what we want to be about is the mission of God. Do we want to be serious about our own community of faith? Absolutely. But do we want to live in such a way that says there's something great, of greater importance than just us and our gathering here? Absolutely, we do. So, so I don't know whether you know this or not, but um, we are a part of the Acts 29 Church Planting Network. Um, if, you're, if you know your Bible and you're like, well, wait a minute, Acts doesn't have 29 chapters. Yeah, 
So what we're trying to communicate by calling it Acts 29 is that what God, had de- what God did in Acts chapter 1 through verse 28, or chapter 28, he actually continues to do, which is to push the gospel forward around the globe by the heralding of the word of God and by planting churches everywhere. And so Acts 29 is a network of churches that plants churches, that plants churches, that plants churches churches. Uh, Let me tell you a bit about our network. There are 468 churches in our network, 18 denominations represented in Acts 29. So there are Baptists, there are Presbyterians, there are EV Free. I'm not going to list all 18 of them. Uh, There are Acts 29 churches in 61 countries on six continents. In fact, I'm fresh back from a trip to the UK, and it was spectacular. Our big event there was in Cardiff, Wales. We had uh, close to 400 men and women from all over Europe gather in Cardiff. We had uh, a large group from France and a group from Italy and a group from Norway and and a group from um, Germany and and then from Iceland. Who knew? I didn't even know there were people in Iceland, all right? And and a group from Iceland was there and it was being being translated in all these different languages. So, So I was preaching my normal clip and pace and seeing these poor guys panicking in the corner trying to translate into German very quickly into headphones into other people and what we got to see was that the gospel is global and here's what I found in my recent trip to Europe that God knows nothing of hard ground God knows nothing of difficult countries I I witnessed firsthand young passionate men and women worshiping Jesus Christ and replanting churches all over Europe. And, and I know, well, the cathedrals are empty. Yeah, they are. They're historic landmarks. But I got to preach down on Piccadilly where they're Broadway in a theater that holds the, um, the, the musical Grease and got to preach to a packed, not a seat open theater of 20-somethings worshiping Christ passionately, celebrating communion and baptizing new believers. And on top of that, there are 142,932 people that worship uh, every weekend in Acts 29 churches. Last year, there were close to 19,000 people that came to know Christ in our churches. Currently, we have 656 church planters in training. So you can see we're set to exponentially grow over the course of the next two years depending on how that training ferrets out and last year we planted 171 churches around the globe and and here's what's interesting um in all kinds of locations so a great deal of our plants are wanting to get into urban centers um if you know history um there was a season in which uh, our parents um fled out of the city to create the the suburbs and what they did is they kind of just took the church with them Right? And now what's happened is 20 and 30 year olds are moving back into the cities and you've got this, what I believe to be a spectacular melting pot of backgrounds, colors, and creeds. And so we've got a lot of guys that are wanting to plant in those urban centers so that there might be a viable gospel witness back in the urban course. And then we've got guys planting in uh, suburbia and then we've got guys planting uh, in rural areas as, as those are places that are shrinking and dying and churches are shrinking and dying out there. And you've got guys headed into rural areas of the country and of the world to plant very biblically serious, gospel-loving, Christ-exalting churches. And you and I, this is what we're a part of, the money that, that you give. Some of it goes to this. We want to spend our lives in this way to make much of Christ by not making much of us. Like there, there's going to be a certain level of comfort here that, that we just don't go past. Right? I've said since day one, I'm, I'm not going to make you a coffee shop. I want you to drink coffee. I want you to stay awake. But we want to be mindful to engage the world around us with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So go and pick up your latte and know your barista and walk kindly and compassionately with those uh, around you. That would be our preference. We want to spend our lives making much of Jesus and being serious about God's plan to establish little localized communities of faith that reflect well his glory to the world around him. Imperfect people striving towards maturity, stumbling and bumbling along the way, all covered by the grace of 
Jesus Christ. Now, uh, with this in view, I want to ask you to consider uh, a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, I want to ask you to consider um, praying along these lines. In Matthew chapter 9, um, I'll pick it up in verse 36, Jesus says, or the Bible says, when he saw the crowds, Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Verse 37, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so um, what we want to pray for, what we want to ask God for, uh, as, as our localized congregation, we want to pray that God would raise up men. We want to pray that God would raise up those who would go out and, and plant churches, that, that we might disciple, encourage, and train in such a way that there are those even in here today that are excelling in business, that are excelling in another field, who become convinced by the Spirit of God that God would have them actually plant one of these little candles in the midst of a dark and depraved generation and that we might see among Acts 29 churches men raised up, trained, and launched out to plant churches any and everywhere on planet earth. And so I want you to begin to take serious this call to pray for this, to ask God to raise up these men. Like, like I already mentioned, you can see how many guys we have in the Q right now or in our training programs. I got back from the UK, so Q is kind of in my um, vernacular right now. I'm trying to get it out, but it'll take a little bit of time. And, and so I want you to start to pray with me. And then here's something else I want you to consider. Uh, I want you to consider going. Uh, here's Here's what I mean by that. More and more and more, you're going to hear, hey, we're, we're looking at planting a church here. We're looking at planting a church here. We're looking at planting a church here. Here, out of our church, we've already planted even in the immediate vicinity. We've planted a church in Frisco. We've planted a church in Keller. We've planted a church in Capel. These are all within 20, 25 minutes of us. And each time we've done that, we said, hey, do you live out there? Maybe you should check that out. Instead of driving past that to us, why don't you check this out? And then where we'll go from here is, hey, anybody want to go to Chicago? Anybody want to move to Chicago? Santa Barbara, anyone? I'm thinking about going to that one myself. <laughs> anyone want to, and we want to encourage you, would you join a core team that's going to launch into a city and plant a church? Would you consider going? Uh, maybe that just means going to another church locally that we plant, or maybe that, that involves you uh, moving because you have that type of flexibility to be a part of a plant, but it does mean that you're serious about how the gospel pushes out and, and hits the ends of the earth. And then um, here's the last thing that, that I want to put before you. I'd, I'd also like you to consider and pray about um, giving financially to Acts 29. And so you got a card when you walked in the door that kind of has some of the statistics of what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, if you're not a believer in Christ, I, you, can, you can right now hit pause if you want. I, I don't want you to feel like we're after your, your money at all. In fact, you just keep your, your money. And for those of you who are believers, uh, when all said and done, uh, 829 is not getting wealthy. For all that you see here on that little handout we gave you, Acts 29 has three full-time staff members. I'm the president and my annual salary is zero dollars and zero cents so if you pile up all the cash i make for leading this thing it's invisible <laughs> it, it's it's just not it's an empty table and and so in the end would, would you consider giving towards this would you hear here's how it'll work uh this is happening at every acts 29 church um uh in the united states um, we, we just call this weekend uh, Church Planning Sunday, and of the money's raised, 40% of it is staying at the church. And so 40% of the money we raise this weekend and moving forward will actually be spent on church planting here in our context, in our city, how our church does church planting. Then the 60% is actually going to Central to help fund some of the training, some of the staffing needs, some of the Central needs uh, of this network and so will you consider and and pray through maybe supporting uh, and you can do that in in one of two ways you can give today and the information is there on your card or you can give in the coming days and again the information there is on your card in regards to how to get online and do that uh, but but i want you to consider financially supporting the work of acts 29 and church planning globally because i really believe that this is the heart of god now let, let me kind of close us out um like this um, it, it struck me, um, I, I think it struck me probably about the time I, my daughter started interacting with the world uh, around her. Um, I, I'm 38, um, so I'm not an old man, but I'm not a young man anymore. 
uh, I'm in what I'll just call the cruising altitude of life, all right? There, I'm up here, there's no more climb, we're just there, all that's left is the descent, okay? And so, don't get upset about that, it's true, all right? You know, that's not true. Okay, why are you cramping up from sitting down for 10 minutes, all right? It is. And, and so, uh, hit the cruise. But here's, here's what I know. Like, the world that my children are growing up in is nothing like the world I grew up in. So, the, so maybe you don't categorize me here, but I, when I was a kid, televisions did not have a remote control. And I know that because that's what I did. I know they didn't because my dad would say, NBC and turn it down. And since there was no such thing as time out, there was a holy fear that had you get up and go turn the television like you were asked. All right, there wasn't sit on the step and think about that. They're, they're, you're just going to get smacked around a bit. And, and so there was no remote control. That's why people were having kids. <laughs> and I, I mean, I could go on and on and on with this. The world's just very, very, very different. And, and so now I watch my kids interact with the world. And, and here's, here's what's really kind of spectacular to watch. Like there's more to do for my children than there's ever been made available for any human being ever. Uh, ever, literally, they can download a new game today because they already got bored with the game they downloaded yesterday. And, and then, like, I, I'm, I'm, I took my son out for just a little, uh, we call it a mandate. Uh, we went out for a little mandate, and uh, I got a cup of coffee. He got a, a soda. We just sat at Starbucks and caught up on life. He was kind of uh, chronicling his week for me, which was fascinating, and, and I kind of chronicled mine. And then uh, we're driving home from, so from Starbucks uh, uh, to my house, uh, all in all about a five-minute drive. And in the car, on the way home, he sighs in the back. <sighs> What's up, buddy? I'm bored. You, you're bored? <laughs> I'm bored. I was like, how, how can you be bored? We, we literally walked out of, you're in the car. It's a five minute drive home. Can I use your phone? No, you cannot see my phone. Look out the window, all right? <laughs> For a hundred years, we've stared out the window and we've turned out just fine. Look out the window. You can't have my phone. <laughs> so you've got the most entertained generation the world has ever known. And look at me. Something's gnawing at us. Something's gnawing at us. We're bored. You've got a ton of young men who like to play war and none who actually want to go to it. You got a ton of men and women who are drawn to great themes and dramas but don't want to participate in the greatest one that the universe will ever know. Has it not struck you that it's strange that our culture is driven towards movies that embody sacrifice and service and yet those two things are things that are hard to find in most modern men. Uh, I'll sacrifice and I'll serve. See, what you and I are being invited into is what our hearts were created for. If you do an extreme close-up on the Christian faith and all it is is about you getting better and you improving morally and you never pan out of that extreme close-up and see all that God is doing and join God in the mission of God to herald his name to the ends of the earth, then you will be stunted in your development and in your maturing into the fullness of Christ and you will miss out on the sanctification that occurs when you give yourself over to who God is and the gospel and the mission of God in regards to planting churches. So will you pray and consider and go and give and be a part of what God is doing? There will be a day where history is rewritten there will be new heroes, new celebrities. There will be a new timeline of how history unfolded. And, and my hope is to give my life and have it rung out for the one that will echo throughout eternity and not the one that will be purged and burnt up upon the return of Christ. And so as a church, in regards to structure and leadership, we're going to be more and more serious about church planting. We're going to give more and more money to church planting. And so I'm asking you outside of the organizational component, but as the organic component, to also join us in our seriousness about how we want to do missions globally, which is primarily through church planting. Well, won't you get in the fight and leave the boredom behind? Let's pray. 
Father, I thank you for these men and women just believing and trusting that you have drawn into this place those you would have be here today. Pray that you would encourage our hearts. Pray that we would be reminded that you saved us, called us to yourself, and that we would marvel at that. And I also pray, Father, God, that you would uh, help our hearts, minds, and eyes pan back off of just us and our salvation and pan off of just this church and all that you've done in this church, God, and that you might lift our eyes to the ends of the earth, uh, and that you might stir up our hearts to be prayerful, you might stir up our hearts, many of us, to go, and that you would stir up our hearts to the man to give, not under compulsion or, or heavy-handedness, God, but just out of an overflow of our gratitude in our salvation and in the hopes that you would do in others what you have done with us. Would you uh, open up um, our wallets and open up our checking accounts so that others might hear, others might know, and others might get to rest in the marvelous, matchless grace that you have lavished upon us. And it's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Love you guys. Matt, to sow into our lives today. If you enjoyed that, would you put your hands together for just a minute? He has a great way of communicating. I'm, I'm proud to serve under him through the Acts 29 network, and we echo his sentiment on the topic of church planting. It's at the heart of what we do. It's a huge part of how we spend our missions budget here at Journey Church as well. I'm a church planter at heart. Um, we planted our first church in 2003. We were blessed to plant the Celebration Church Orange Park campus over on Kingsley. It started in our home with 18 people. When we left, it had over 1,000 people in weekly attendance. It was a, a wonderful experience. We left there. or Actually, while we were there, we also helped plant a church in Mandarin. We helped plant a church in Peru. And then uh, ultimately, we ended up here at Journey Church. And even as Matt said, uh, he's 38 years old. I'm turning 43 on Friday. So church planting is a young man's game. It is not for those of us who are getting old. So my heart and Mary Jo's heart is here. We're here. We're planted at Journey Church. And our job in turn is to help plant other churches. And if you don't know the history of Journey, that's been a part of our DNA from the very beginning. We have helped churches either directly or indirectly get started. Uh, Reverb Church in St. John's County that meets out there at the World Golf Village uh, was pastored by Pastor Brian and, and Renee Lamoureux. They started here. They were our first worship leaders. He was on our teaching team. They planted that church in 2012, January of 2012. It's going strong. They're doing great down there. We love them. We're glad to be a part of what God's doing. So we were able to help them very directly. So what we've generally done is kind of float back and forth. We always sponsor one church very directly financially per year to help them. 2012, it was Reverb Church. 2013, it's the Image Church in downtown Jacksonville. Pastor Matt Jensen, we're helping them financially. We're helping them in many ways. And always we have other ones going on. Like right now we're supporting an African-American church plant down in West Palm Beach. We're working with the Haitian church that's right down there where our old building used to be off of 797 Blanding. So continually this thought of church planting is on the hearts of the leaders here at Journey Church. And we want to continue that. In fact, the National Conference for Acts 29 is coming up mid-June. I'm going to be heading out there with those 600 plus people that he was talking about. And each year that we've gone there, we've been blessed to hand a check to some church planters so that they can continue the work that God's called them to do. Right now, we actually have some of our own congregation, Danny and Victoria Narvaez. They are in North Carolina. They had their first meeting last night. They're getting ready to move there to go plant a church in North Carolina. God is good. He's expanding the kingdom. He's spreading the gospel through this concept of church planting. And I pray that you'll want to be a part of that. So you've got these little cards that we've given you. And if you're a guest, you're absolutely exempt from this. But if you call Journey Church your home, I want you to consider the possibility, you know, once a year we pick a cause outside of Journey Church. This year it's church planting that we could sow over and above our normal tithes and offerings to make a difference. We don't do this very often. One weekend per year we pick a cause, we go over and above. So this is that weekend. Maybe God would impress upon your heart to go over and above your tithes and offerings to help plant churches in America and around the world. Maybe not this week, but think about it, pray about it. There's a line on your offering. Offering envelopes, there's a line when you
you give online or at the kiosk that says missions. If you designate funds as missions, it will be used for this cause. So I want to encourage you to do that. So we have some plants that we have that we want to help either indirectly or directly through Journey. That's what would, these funds would go to to help make that happen. One personal need that we're praying for here, and I, I ask you to join us, our area is becoming increasingly more culturally diverse. Um, when I moved here in 2000, if you went through the Orange Park Mall, there would be maybe 10% African American when you walk through the Orange Park Mall. Today, it is very diverse. There's people of all backgrounds. Dare I say at least 50% of the people when you walk through the Orange Park Mall today would be African American. There's people of all cultures, and if the culture around our area is changing, we better do our best to get out there and reach them. Would you agree? Would you agree? So we're making an important stride within the body of Journey Church to reflect the community around us. You see, we have Carlos, who's a Puerto Rican worship leader. That was a very intentional thought process when he came to join our team. Pastor Leo is from Brazil, very intentional in what we were wanting to do to create a multicultural staff. I'm just two white people. Do you get that? I'm just too white, and our heart is to reach people of all backgrounds. So one of the things that we're praying for right now is that we would have an African-American pastor come and join us to be a part of our teaching team so that we can continue to reach the community around us. I think that's a very important need that we have. So I would ask you to join us in that prayer. So I'm going to go ahead and pray over the offering. The ushers are going to come forward. And Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the guests who are here today. We thank you that um, Pastor Matt could so into our lives, even all the way from Dallas today. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing around the country within the Acts 29 network, around the world. And Father, we thank you that we get to play a part in it. We thank you that our finances, our time, our energy, our resources could go into advancing the kingdom of God in this way. And Father, I just pray that we would be a group of people who would always want to be about advancing the gospel in our own lives, personally, corporately, as the church that we call Journey church here and throughout the world through Acts 29. So Lord, I ask you to impress upon the hearts of our people to pray for some of the things that are going on right now. We pray for Danny and Victoria as they get ready to go up um, or as they're actually finding themselves in North Carolina right now getting ready to plant the church. We pray for Pastor Matt Jensen who we're helping at Image Church downtown. We're just so excited about what you're doing. We don't know what churches uh, are going to be birthed right out of this congregation in the months and years ahead, but we know you're going to do that. You're going to send people here for the express purpose of coming in, getting raised up and going right back out to make a difference. So Father, we even lift up our own need of becoming more and more multicultural as a congregation and in our staff. So Father, we ask you that you would move in all of these things and touch our hearts and just help us to prioritize our lives about making the kingdom of God our primary concern in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen and amen. Ushers, feel free to take up the offering as they do. I'll just share one or two final announcements today. One, I thank you for being here. If you're a guest, thank you for choosing to come out and join us. If you're a regular attender, would you go out there and invite people? Bring them with you next weekend. It's going to be a spectacular weekend here as we've got a guest speaker who's a wounded warrior who's going to come share with us on Memorial Weekend. Mary Jo and I want to cordially and personally invite you out to that event at 8 p.m. in Green Coast Spring on Memorial Night, so come out and be a part of that. And then groups fairs right around the corner. We have about 35 small groups that are going to be launching two weeks from now. So man, give God some glory. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he give you peace. In Jesus' name, live your lives to make a difference in the lives of others. God bless you. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Once again, we want to thank you for joining us here for one of our inspiring messages at Journey Church. If you live in the greater Jacksonville area, we want to invite you to come out to one of our weekend experiences. Our service times are Saturday night at 6 p.m., Sunday at 9.30 a.m., or 11.15 a.m. Or if you would like to, you can join us online at any time watching any of our services live at journeychurch.org. We look forward to seeing you next time.